The .NET Core podcast is supported by our listeners who have become patrons. To see a full list of the patrons, or to join them, head over to .netcore.show slash patrons. Hello everyone and welcome to the .NET Core podcast. The only podcast which is devoted to .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, EF Core, SignalR, and not forgetting the .NET Core community itself. I am your host, Jamie gabrug Mantella, and this is episode 41, Visual Recode with Mark Rendell. In this episode, I interviewed Mark about Visual Recode, why you should consider using it to move your WCF applications over to gRPC, why you might want to do that, and what doing so actually provides you with. This is actually part two of an interview that I had with Mark. It was so densely packed that I wanted to split it into two episodes so that we wouldn't overload you with all of the great stuff that Mark has to say. If you haven't heard part one, check out episode 39, GRPC with Mark Rendell, for a little background on the topics that we discuss in this episode. So let's sit back, open up a terminal, type in .name new podcast, and let the show begin. So we were going to also talk about uh, visual is visual recode, isn't it? Visual recode, yes. Okay, yeah. So this was as I started getting into the looking and, and writing stuff for WCF developers going, don't be afraid of gRPC. It actually does most of the things that you want. And it does them in a very similar way. It's not that different. And I was I idly mused on Twitter. One of the nice things about WCF is with its service contracts and its implementations and its fault contracts and its uh, data contracts, all those attributes. Basically, there was enough metadata in those attributes and within the code itself to generate the WSDL file. And the WSDL file is like a really, really horrible, long XML schemered late 90s, early 2000s equivalent of the proto file. And I thought if you can generate a WSDL file using reflection, then I wonder if I could generate a proto file using Roslyn. And so I had a quick go, and then a quick go turned into, I think, a fortnight of evenings with my wife going, are you coming downstairs ever again? <laughs> and I'm like, I, I, I just, it's, I'm trying to code myself out of a job. <laughs> um, but at the end of two weeks, I got a, a very, very simple WCF application. Um, and not only could I generate the proto file to, to define the equivalent application in... Um, in gRPC, I could also copy across all the necessary code and wire it up to, yeah, basically I had a console application that you could run on a WCF, my test WCF application, and it would output the the result and you could run the result and it was a gRPC application. Okay. Um, I wrote a couple of blog posts doing my benchmark comparisons of the two and that was actually done using a generated application but from this it was a console application and it was basically custom written for this one WCF thing and if you threw something at it it didn't understand it would explode and and I hadn't even got as far as putting in command line arguments to say that solution never mind the fact that that solution might have a hundred projects in it and you want to tell it exactly and it, it would have been a nightmare to use from the command line and Speaking of open source, I have open sourced everything I've ever done in in this way. Things like simple data, which was my an idle experiment to see if you could do something, and then ended up going nuts. But this time, I thought, I if I open source this, then people is it, people are going to want to use it which means I'm going to have to support it and I haven't got time to support it and anyway the people who have this problem and the people who are angry about Microsoft dropping support for WCF they've got millions of lines of code 
and each of those lines of code has cost them a dollar. So I'm not, I, I got in touch with um, Kendall Miller at Gibraltar Software, who is a good friend of mine. And I said, hey, Kendall, look what I've done. And he went, ooh, and I went, do you think I could sell that? And he said, I think I could sell it. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if you turn it into a Visual Studio plugin and, and make it easy to use and make it fit nicely with the Visual Studio thing, then I think we've got something that, uh, that we can go to market with. And so that's what I've been working on. Literally four o'clock this afternoon, I did a push to our private GitHub repository, which triggered a build on Azure DevOps. And I said, that's preview one. <laughs> um, preview, which hopefully we're going to be distributing within the next couple of days. We need to do, he's got to sort his certificates out and sign the package and everything. And we're just going to send the VSIX to a few people to start off with. And so, so far it does WCF request response, but it will pretty much generate the gRPC application. And as long as everything, as long as all the code in the WCF application is valid .NET Core code, then it will just work. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of red squeals that you have to fix, but it still does a big chunk of the work. And gets um, it gets you sort of 90%, 99% yes. of the Nin way there. Right? Yes, and it will vary from, yeah. from person to person. And, you know, there's obviously, you've still got to then go, well, how, where do I run the gRPC application? Because you can't run it in IIS mm. at the moment. You might be able to run it in IIS by the end of next year, because um, IIS and HTTP Sys don't support all the features of HTTP2, um, response trailers, things like that. But it will, hopefully, <laughs> the majority of people's valuable code is not the stuff that's decorated with data contract and data member and operation contract and, and that sort of thing. Hopefully it's in um, some kind of layered architecture and, and dependency injection. Um, but what, what Recode actually does is it reads your contracts, generates the proto file, copies your service contract implementation and your data contract stuff across, sets up, uh, adds your service contract to dependency injection, so then it can be injected into the gRPC service, and then maps from .NET data types to gRPC data types and back again. But for the most part, it is just your code that has been copied across. It also detects all the dependencies, so it goes through the entire solution. So if you've got a repository, it'll pull that across. If you've got a factory, it'll pull that across. And it'll drag all these things across into a nice shiny new .NET Core 3 project. And it generates a report to tell you it's done it. And it puts comments in various bits of the code going, hey, not sure what's happening here. You might want to fix this. But yeah, uh, so first preview, very simple WCF to gRPC. I'm working on getting it to do duplex. Uh, so duplex is really weird because duplex with WCF, you have a callback interface. And you go, hey, server, I have this type here which implements this interface. When you want to ask me something, call a method on this interface. And then the server generates a kind of stub proxy thing for that. And it's, whoa. Um, you can reproduce that with bi-directional streaming in gRPC, but it's it's quite different. So actually what Rico is going to do is generate the gRPC stuff, but then wrap it in those interfaces. So the interface will be a kind of facade over the stream at both ends. So your client code, you'll be able to take that callback interface that you've already written and just hook it into the stream and it will carry on working exactly the same. And then when I started working on that, I thought, why don't I do that for all the client stuff? So you generate your gRPC client in the normal way, but then I can generate you a wrapper class around that that has exactly the same API as your old WCF client, right. um, which you can then you know bundle those two things into a NuGet package and ship it and 
reasonable chance <laughs> that um, other developers who are using uh, your WCF client can just drop it in and not even notice that anything's changed. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of next step. Okay. Um, and yeah, the aim is to have it sort of uh, essentially feature complete by the end of the year. Oh, wow. um, but once we've, we've got our early preview partners and it's going to be interesting. Um, <laughs> we've, we've been speaking to a few people and yeah, we're talking about people who've got solutions with hundreds of projects in a single solution. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, we're going to throw it in the deep end and give yeah. it to these guys wow. and work quite closely with them. And yeah, so it's not open source because my hope is that I can be doing this for a living yeah. in a year's time. Yeah, like you um, said, you know, you release it open source, it becomes a full-time job to yeah. support it anyway. Yes. So why um, not charge a few bucks, make a little money and support it at the same time? Yeah. Um, it's not going to be prohibitively expensive. Um, and for a lot of people, so you look at something like uh, ReSharper or InCrunch, that's an ongoing expense. You need to, they're subscription based and you buy it and then you can stop paying the subscription and you're stuck with that version that you've got. But ReSharper is something that you are going to want to be using for the rest of your life, yep. the rest of your professional life. Visual Recode, if it does its job properly, for a lot of people, it will be buy this for a couple hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, um, whatever the price for an individual license ends up being. Run your code through it once, you're done. We haven't got any new get packages, so any supporting code we need, we generate directly into your application. And yeah, for a lot of people, it's going to be, we'll just get it, we'll run stuff through it, and once we're done, we're done, and then we don't need it anymore. Thanks very much. Um, and that's great. Uh, and then the big organizations who've got hundreds of millions of lines of code across thousands and thousands of projects, it's going to take them a bit longer. And so those are the guys where we're going to be digging in for the, for the long haul and sort of reacting to their needs and feedback and, yep. and reports and so on. Judging by some of Microsoft past sort of um, escapades, we'll probably add in functionality maybe even in a light version so that when .NET 5 comes along and they've changed project files again, it'll do that for yeah. you as well. But yeah, that's the sort of thing. If I can get to the point where my living costs are covered by that revenue stream, plus hopefully some consulting. So, you know, I can come in and I can look at your systems and I can say, this is that's that one and that one and that one. And yeah, no, there's no way a Roslyn analyzer can understand whatever that is. Mm -hmm. But also I can help people with sort of running it on Kubernetes and setting up service meshes and load testing and planning adoption strategies and all that sort of thing. And yeah, if we can get to the point where it's generating enough revenue to be a, a sustainable business, then uh, there's a very real possibility that some of the more widely usable features will be in a sort of light version or a, sure. um, like I think Code Rush has a free version and a paid version, doesn't it? So yeah. we've discussed that as a possible model sure. once it's paying for itself. So, okay. But yeah, I'm very excited about it. I have never worked so hard on a personal project um, as I have on this. Uh, I've never spent quite so much time dotting T's and crossing I's and and using the valuable lessons that I've learned from my eight-year-old son about testing. Yes. I'm, I'm very excited. I think it's, it's, uh, it looks really good. Um, it's got two modes. There's a wizard. It says, what do you want to do? And three of the buttons are disabled. I want to convert a WCF application to gRPC. And then it goes, OK, so open an existing solution or create a new one and then open a project or create a project and then choose the service contract that you want to convert across. And then if it's got a callback contract, it'll go, I'm sorry, I can't do that yet. But this is the thing, I've been testing the sad path. It doesn't just kind of go, oh, 
I don't know what's happening and crash. Yep. It actually stops you from shooting yourself in the foot. That takes you through the kind of nice step by step and there's a progress bar and it generates it and then there's just a button that says open this in another Visual Studio. But once you've got started, you can actually just click a service contract or a data contract or any class you like in your Solution Explorer and drag it onto the Visual Recode window and it doesn't only bring that class across, it also brings all its dependencies across. Right, okay. um, and it, um, it rewrites NuGet package mappings. If you've got a NuGet package reference and it can't find a net standard or a net core version, then it'll put that into the report saying, there's no net core version of this. And also <laughs> this NuGet package you're using hasn't been updated since 2005 which is actually before NuGet. How have you done that? <laughs> um, but yeah, Visual Studio extensions are not the easiest things to write. I have a newfound respect for the ReSharper guys and, and Mark Miller who does Code Rush and Remco Mulder who does NCrunch and anybody who writes Mads Christensen who just churns them out yes. and gives them away and bless him for putting all the source code for all of them on GitHub <laughs> yeah. because... There, there have been a lot of times when I go, oh, how do you do... Oh, hang on, I'll go and check my hands yeah, thing. See what I'm um, <laughs> Yes. Uh, I think the most frustrating thing of all, though, I'm pretty sure this is irony. I've been all over ASP.NET Core and .NET Core since it was Project K. Yes. I was actually an MVP when they started working on it, which means I knew about it under NDA for about six months yes. before they announced it to the public. Um, and I was downloading it and doing things with it. I put a production microservice out <laughs> when it was still Project K. Wow. It did one thing, it generated GUIDs. It, it had an HTTP endpoint. It didn't matter what you sent to it. It would send back text slash text, and it was just a GUID. And the only reason it existed was because Node is terrible at generating UIDs. <laughs> I think you could have left the generating UIDs off of that sentence. Personal opinion. But. No, Node is very good at some of the things that Node is very good at, as long as it doesn't need to do something with the CPU. As soon as yes. it needs to do something with the CPU, that's it, everything stops. And if it takes a tenth of a second to generate a UUID, which in JavaScript on the hardware we had was roughly how long it took, that means you can serve 10 requests a second which when you're writing a web bug for one of the UK's biggest websites to track people's progress through their thing, isn't really enough. And I have blogged about it and I've been talking about it at conferences for the last three years. And I've been, you know, with Netcore 3 and C Sharp 8, I've been sort of keeping up with it and downloading all the previews and everything. And now the thing that I'm spending most of my spare time working on and the thing that I would dearly love to be able to do for a living, .NET 4.7.2. Because that's what Visual Studio is written in. Yep. And that's what I have to use. And I'm really, really, really hoping that Visual Studio 2021 is going to be ported over to .NET 5. Or... They're going to have to do it eventually. Yeah. But... I, I imagine it's going to be bloody difficult. Yes. So, yeah, I'm not going to hold yes. my breath. I keep typing C sharp eight code and then yes. just getting red squeals and it's going because ah, you can't. C sharp seven point three works with .NET four seven two. Yes. But C sharp eight, no, they changed <laughs> too much. Okay. Um, so I can't do switch expressions and I can't turn on nullable references even, which would be really useful. No, I'm very, very proud of it, and I'm, I'm really excited once we've got the feedback from the early preview guys um, and things have stabilised a bit, then it will go on to the Visual Studio Marketplace. And until we actually come out with our 1.0, what you will get from the Marketplace will be the full thing, but it will explode 30 days after we released it. Okay. In the best way of all early access programs, of course, um, yeah. there, there's a time limit on it. Yes. Um, but if you're cunning um, and you're quick and you've only got a little bit of WCF code, then there's a very real chance that you could probably get the whole thing done before we actually release a paid version. 
Well, I mean, um, I wouldn't recommend so. people do that, but no, I think it's a good idea yeah. to try it out. Um, uh, absolutely. Throw your yes. WCF code um, at it if yeah. you get the chance to during that 30-day window. Yes. And just see what it can do. Yes. Because there might be things that you have done or your team has done or the person who wrote the WCF code that you're maintaining has done that maybe Visual Recode doesn't know about yet. Or absolutely. Doesn't support yet. As, or doesn't support full stop. Yeah. At which point they could contact they can maybe contact me website, and I can go, and go oh, I could, I could make it do that. Or... Um, yeah, no, just don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but maybe put up a message box going, could you refactor this before you convert it? Because it'll make my everything exactly. much easier. And, or um, or yeah. indeed, it might just be part of the 1%, 10%, 20% of stuff that Visual Code Recode sorry, can't do because it can't do everything. Yeah. But it will take away the six months yes. of painful um, pulling out what's left of everyone's hair and screaming at everyone, trying to get everything slowly moved over. Yes. Whereas you can maybe do it in a half a day. I'm stuff. really hoping that the stuff it can do is the boring stuff. Because nobody wants to sit there with two screens, with a service contract on one of them, typing the equivalent proto file on the other one. That's just, that's nuts. That is not a way anyone wants to spend the next three years. So... Yeah, it's not even artificial intelligence. It's just if this, then that, if this, then that, filter this, replace these. Which it I, is doing the most mindless aspect of the programming for you. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think it's, it's certainly not going to be taking anyone's jobs away or anything. I'm kind of half thinking once I've done with this, I'm going to do COBOL. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying it's not going to take anyone's job away, it's not. But there is an argument for when a project manager comes to you and says, we want you to take this WCF, this code base. I, d I don't understand what it is because I'm a project manager. I want you to take this code and make it run on the, the new hot sexiness because I've heard all of these keywords and all of these buzzwords and I've been to a few talks with other project managers. Do it and then you go, it's going to take six months. Or we can spend dollars because you don't know maybe what the price is going to be yet to download an app that will do most of it and it'll take me a couple of weeks to sort of fix the, yes, the extra yeah. bits. It's a no-brainer. The project manager's going to go, I will get the authorization for the... Yeah, if you say it would take six months, there's a very real chance that's not going to happen at all. Exactly. Whereas if you say $300 or $1,000, 1500 for a team license um, and we can do it in six weeks or a sprint... Or what you know, and this depends on your project. Then it doesn't just make it quicker; it turns it into something that is going to happen, exactly, as opposed to something that's not going to happen. Yeah, and yeah, that's got to be good because um, there's a project management technique that I know of. I'm not a project manager at all, but where you draw an uh, you know an x and y axis of uh, maximum effort and maximum reward. And yes. Converting from WCF over to GLPC, maybe maximum effort, but almost zero reward because you, your current system is running. Yes. And certainly if you're in anything in the financial sector, anything in public facing, so NHS, which is one of the biggest IT organizations in the UK, anything like that, they've got developers who spend their entire careers just keeping up with changes in regulation. Yep. And so it's not a matter of they're not willing to spend six months retooling from one technology to another. They can't yes. because they've got to keep changing the way the tax regulations work or the way the SEC reporting is done or the way patient data is. You know, they've got to stay on top of this stuff. It's very easy, I think, for people who haven't worked in enterprise environments. There's there's some sneering. There's the, the derp. Yeah. Um, thing, which is there are some really, really smart people working in those environments. And, you know, WCF. We kind of go, oh, what are you using WCF for? You should have been doing REST and, and hypermedia. Those, there are people who are doing things with WCF that I didn't know it could do, and it's doing it fast. And, yeah. they, you know, they're really pushing it. And so, yeah, one thing I've learned over the last sort of course of this year, really, is, yeah, not to make assumptions about other people's situations. Yes, I have 
a hundred thousand lines of code in this thing that I've written and it really wouldn't take very long to change it from an MVC application to a gRPC application. But yeah, walk a mile in their shoes. Definitely. Um, and if I can help people uh, not get stuck in yet another computer legacy trap, yes. and if I can make a bit of money while I'm doing it, then I will be very happy. Yeah, exactly. And that, I, you know, I think I try to do that with some of the stuff that I do. I try to give back. If there's something that I can do to help someone, even if it saves someone five minutes, that's five. Like the way I see it is, that's five minutes of their life they're never going to get back. You know, and Absolutely. like you say, if you're trapped in a situation where every couple of weeks you're having to change because of some regulation or because of some uh, management decision or some decision somewhere else yeah. that you have no control over, and you have to change every now and again then you're never going to progress with whatever project you're working on. So yeah. it's taking away that, let's not worry about the progression, but you do the bit that you're great at, which is the, you know, the, without trying to reduce what you're doing, the you, you're looking after making sure that it's, you know, regulatory or we'll just come in and just do the bit that needs to be done. And then you can just sort of jump back onto where you were. That's it. And away you go. You have your domain knowledge. You know how your business works. You know what its requirements are. You know all the other parts of your business and you've written the ridiculously complicated algorithms and database queries and everything else that actually makes you money, I'm just gonna come along and shave this exterior bit off and put this new exterior bit on for you. And one of the things that we'd like to be able to do is in the same way that people, that I said you can have an MVC, so a, an HTTP API and a gRPC API running off the same code one thing i thought would be really nice so we'll do the thing where we can generate a client wrapper so it looks the same at both ends so it makes it easier to to migrate um, but also to be able to put notes in the generated code so if you then change the wcf application you can hit refresh and it pulls the changes from the wcf application across into the grpc application so you can be continuing to add features on the side that you're used to and run WCF and gRPC in parallel and have them doing the same thing, talking to the same databases and the same backend services and everything else. Because I had I was talking to somebody and he's kind of like, yeah, we've got a WCF thing and it's just doing SOAP, but we've got 150 utility providers of some description all talking to our API and we can't turn around to them and say, hey, because they're external. Yeah. You don't, and again, you don't know what they're going through. And so, yeah, I, I kind of went away and did some kind of rough notes and uh, can I do this and what would I have to do? But yeah, to be able to kind of go, okay, so we're doing gRPC now, here's a proto file, but not have to be actively maintaining two code bases. Yeah. Either by, you know, let's yank this out into a dual framework shared library that works with both of them. And as much as possible, I think that's the best way to go. But also just being able to go, change the API slightly, added an extra integer parameter. So I'm just gonna drag that across and put it in the proto on this side and so on. So yeah, the aim is that my wife's kind of going, so they buy it, they use it, and then that's it. <laughs> How long are you expecting to make a living off this for? By the same token, you will end up with customers who don't just have one WCF stack. Like you were saying, you've got, got hundreds of thousands of projects in one place. of stuff. And also, you know, a lot of them are oil tankers as well. And so, yeah, there are going to be companies next year buying this and, and running all their stuff through it. In five years, there's going to be the more conservative companies that are doing it. I have consulted with people in the last four years... Um, who were still running code that was written in Visual Studio 2003, yes. and it's .NET 1.1, and they're kind of going, why is this slow? <laughs> and you're like, is this a 486? <laughs> and it is. And they're kind of going, yes, but we can't upgrade it. And so, yeah, like I say, in, in 10 years' time, maybe there'll be the ones who are finally getting there, and by that point, it's going to be just seamless. Um, 10 years of development, I will get it working. Um, but other things will come along and this is going to be an ongoing situation. In, and yes. 
you don't know what the world's going to look like in 10 years. You know, maybe I'll be kind of going, oh, I can take your UWP application and convert it to run on HoloLens or hey. whatever. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. I mean, you made the joke earlier on about maybe I'll go on to COBOL next, you know, and, and COBOL is a language that was in the 60s, maybe even earlier. My, my entire history of computer programming language is a bit murky, but, you know, and it's still being used now because those yeah. systems are bulletproof. They have to run. They, yeah. with our entire society, whether you know it or not, requires those systems to be up and running. And if they're not, you know, game over. I'm pretty sure people go, oh, COBOL is old and dead. I'm pretty sure anybody who gets paid and their money just appears in their bank account one day every month, I'm 99.9% .9 sure there's some COBOL doing that somewhere in the back system or yes. in the fix system or whatever these things are. And yeah, um, I, I think the real thing there is if you went to the banks and said, hey, I can rewrite all this COBOL code for you, they'd go, why? Why, why would you want to do that? Yeah. It works. It's fine. <laughs> IBM keeps supporting the mainframes exactly. um, and keeps selling us insanely expensive operating system licenses to keep supporting AIX. But yeah, I, I will move with the times and, and kind of go, what can I do now? And also, you know, I've, I've spent the last half of this year writing a book, writing this thing in my spare time, and I've still got a day job. Yes. And I do conferences and program committees, and, and I have been a very busy boy. <laughs> but yeah, if I can get to the point where this is my job, that will give me a lot more time to spend on other things. Because the other thing that maybe I could be doing in 10 years is running an independent game studio with my kids, which would also be awesome. Yeah. Because um, one of them's very arty and very creative and uh, and he's felt tips and, and all this sort of stuff. And his big sister um, seems to have the same coding gene that I've got. I gave her a copy of C Sharp and she just boom. So yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, even if it's just, you know, main full-time job is visual recode, but I've got enough time and space to make games with them and, and stick them on app stores and stuff, that would be awesome too. So where can folks go to learn about Visual Recode then? There's, there's a, there, obviously there's a website. There is a website. It's visualrecode.com. Yes. Um, which, uh, if you've followed my, um, my product naming tendencies in the past, is probably the easiest web address that I've ever used for anything. Visualrecode.com. There's information about the product there. You can sign up for updates. People who sign up to the mailing list for updates will be the second in line for the preview releases. So we've got kind of people we're actually speaking to um, who are gonna do our very, very early testing, the kind of private beta thing. But then people on the mailing list will get informed when there is public beta. Sure. And like I say, it will be full featured, but time limited. So it's not going to go, I'm not doing this, it's a million lines of code. Yes. Because I haven't written code to work out if it's a million lines of code. <laughs> it's just, but then you can get it and you can try it and you can give us feedback. And I'm doing all the development work or the, the lion's share of the development work. Uh, Gibraltar Software, who do Loop and VistaDB. They will be doing all the sales, marketing, uh, licensing, frontline support. So this is... It's got a, a proper software company that's experienced in the enterprise world yep. and in the, the formal software world handling all the, the business stuff. So we will have a support site, we will have a knowledge base, we will have all that sort of stuff as well, which anyone who knows me will be very grateful I'm not <laughs> responsible for that side of things. Okay. Um, but yes, and like I say, the aim is to have it on the Visual Studio Marketplace in November. Okay. Um, and probably have something that we feel comfortable asking people to pay for by the end of the year. Okay, excellent. Okay. Uh, so what about yourself then? What's the best way to keep in touch with what you're up to, what you're doing, all that kind of stuff? Follow me on Twitter. Okay. Um, Mark Rendell, 
R-E-N-D-L-E. Uh, there's a visual recode on Twitter, you can follow that as well. And that's just me as well, but it's another account. <laughs> uh, if you want to see me speak, then um, if you're in the UK or Europe and you have a user group and you'd like to come and talk about GRPC or, or any of this stuff, then reach out through Twitter. I love wandering around and talking <laughs> about stuff. NDC conferences, do all of those. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I put myself out there. Um, and if you're at a conference and you're an attendee and I know a lot of people go to conferences and speakers hang out with other speakers. They're kind of, it's like they're our work buddies, but we only see them every three months. And so we tend to hang out in groups. And somebody told me that they plucked up the courage to come and talk to me, which <laughs> threw me completely because I'm quite, actually I'm quite introverted and I'm quite shy. And one of the reasons that I like speaking at conferences is it helps me to get over that. Yes. I can kind of go, I have a right to be here because I speak. But if you see me at a conference and you want to come up and talk to me about stuff, yes. then as you can probably tell from the fact we've been recording for two hours now, <laughs> um, I love talking and I love talking about tech and I love talking about other things as well. Space and quantum physics and philosophy and stuff. So yeah, I probably won't come up and talk to you at a conference because I'm shy. But yeah, anytime anyone sees me anywhere, just come and say hi. Okay, excellent. Sound advice. Uh, well, that's essentially all the questions that I've got. And like you said, yeah, we have talked about stuff for two hours, but that's fine because I can split that across multiple episodes. So this might be awesome. into the world's first .NET Core <laughs> podcast two-parter. <laughs> Wind me up and let me go. That's it. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, all that really remains to say is uh, thank you ever so much for taking the trip across the city of London <laughs> in rush hour to come and do the show. It really does mean a lot. It's been a pleasure. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And hopefully I'll be speaking to you again. Let's set it up and we'll, we'll speak again in a year's time and I can tell you what my yacht's like. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, right? We'll do the next episode on your yacht. Um, or, you know, maybe when we get Club Penguin with the felt tip drawings on the App Store. Yeah, why And not? I can come and talk to you about that. Excellent. That'll be good. Yeah. I do need to talk to someone about Unity, so... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, like I said, thank you very much for taking the time. It does mean a lot. Cheers. So. Thank you for having me. That was part two of my interview with Mark Rendell. Be sure to check out the show notes for a bunch of links to some of the stuff that we covered and a full transcription of the interview. The show notes, as always, can be found at .netcore.show. And don't forget to spread the word. Leave me a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice and to come back next time for more .net Core goodness. I'll see you again real soon. See you later, folks. .NET Core Podcast is a production of RJJ Software Limited. <laughs>